Welcome to the Guide Exile. For this build guide, we're going to be looking at constructing a very busty, voluptuous, curvy, and uh, uh, dense, viscous? Hmm. The word I'm looking for is just escaping me at the moment. I suppose we could say a husky blade vortex scion. As you can see here, we achieve over a 10,000 life pool. Not only that, but we are able to sustain it very easily, along with getting an amazing damage output. Now how can we have both, may you ask? Well, that is made pretty easy with the new Uber Elder staff, the Disintegrator. As we are using a staff, we can make use of it for our main six link while we use a comb's heart for massive life gain. However, you are easily able to gain more than 8,000 life with any other chest. Now the big selling point of the Disintegrator is a crazy amount of flat physical damage it adds to any spell, along with granting you a new special charge type, Siphoning Charges. Siphoning charges are generated upon using skills, and you gain more of maximum charges by having other Shaper or Elder items equipped. These add even more physical damage to spells and attacks, as well as gaining 4% of non-chaos damage as chaos damage per charge. We also get 0.2 generic damage leech to life per siphoning charge, meaning that we will not need to use a curse or special item to leech. However, their downside is that you take 150 physical damage per charge for 4 seconds, if you use a skill while they are up. This means as we stack more and more charges, we'll take more and more damage, as we are always using skills whilst they are up. Since it is a physical damage over time that we take, it can really only be mitigated by physical or damage over time reductions that work on it such as endurance charges, basalt flask, or various pantheons. Armor and fortify will not work as they require hits and do not work on damage over time. Recovery options such as life regeneration and life leech can also be used to combat it, so we end up making use of a combined effort by investing and in stacking in a lot of life, regen, leech, and endurance charges, such that we do not degen at maximum charges. This build is good for those who like a decent map clear speed with the ability to shred bosses without much care, as they are very unlikely to one-shot you with this life pool and recovery rate. So let us dive deep into this husky scion. The husky blade vortex scion is a very reliable character with a generous amount of life to spare your mistakes. It doesn't make for a great league starter or first character, as we require specific gearing, but it does make for a competent all-arounder for the content in the game from Uberlab to Guardians to Shaper. It won't be dealing millions of damage, but it will be dealing reliable damage along with sustainable defenses. I had a lot of fun trying to min-max the number of Elder and Shaper items I could wear to get a healthy number of siphoning charges, which ended up in me scour chancing some unique Harimsaro gloves on a Shaper base. Offensively, we are a spellcaster that makes use of the spell Blade Vortex. Blade Vortex is one of the best single target spells, as well as being a physical base, which is perfect for the Disintegrator. This is a spell you must cast every so often to maintain stacks, and with any skill effect duration they can last longer. I ended up playing with just a Blade Vortex duration helmet enchantment. As we are making use of the Disintegrator's siphoning charges that not only add physical damage, but take a percentage of our non-chaos damage and add it as chaos damage, we will be fully converting our physical base to elemental. This is because we will then take both a percentage of the original physical and final converted elemental damage and add it as chaos, effectively getting twice the efficiency. Since we are not going critical strikes, this means we can benefit from elemental overload as we are converting, which is another more multiplier. As there are not many great non-crit ways to scale multiple element types within the passive tree, we will get 8 jewel sockets to fill out our generic percentage scaling. As the Scion with the Slayer subclass ascendancy, we also gain Culling Strike on all hits. And finally, we can make use of flasks such as Taste of Hate and Adziri's Promise for more percentage gained as. Defensively, we are stacking a very large life pool, hitting over 10,000 life on a comb's heart. For mapping, I make use of an Impulses for the Lightning Explosions to help with clear speed, and still have over 8,000 life. We get a good portion of this life from Blood Magic. While Blood Magic removes our mana and ability to effectively use auras, we get the ability to spam our Blade Vortex as much as we want, along with a hefty life pool bump to further scale our life regeneration and life leech rate relative to incoming damage and degenerations, such as the flat siphoning charge degeneration. With this large life pool, we managed to also get 10% passive life regeneration and life leech from the Disintegrator staff. Our life leech is buffed via the Slayer from the Scion Ascendancy, letting our life leech stacks continue through full life. This makes our recovery during face tanking consistent, and always topped out at a combined 30% life recovered per second. Making use of Soul of Arakali, we can then buff our life regeneration to 15% and maximum life leech rate to 30% for a total of 45% life recovered per second. Luckily, since our siphoning charges deal physical damage over time, we can make use of cast one damage taken and Immortal Call to force proc Soul of Arakali. Speaking of Immortal Call, we also choose the Juggernaut subclass ascendancy for not only the chill and stun immunity, but for the free endurance charge generation. For 4 seconds after we are hit, we will generate 1 endurance charge per second. This means after 3 seconds we will be at our maximum endurance charges. These endurance charges will then extend our Immortal Call duration to about 2 seconds. 
since the internal cooldown of a mortal call is 3 seconds, we will almost have an always up immortal call and endurance charges when it is not up. With all of this put together, the build is able to take on almost any map monster with any map mods aside from Elemental Reflect. For mapping, I like to use the Blade Vortex with Impulsive Explosions and just run through and Lightning Warp onto enemies and watch them explode. Since the Impulsive's chest is used for the explosions to help clearing, you could very well make use of another 6 link for clearing such as Bladefall, Glacial Cascade, or Ethereal Knives. In the end I found Blade Vortex to work best and only had to worry about one 6 link in that case, making simple gem swaps when necessary. For bossing, we simply charge up to maximum Blade Vortex stacks and siphoning charges, and run onto the boss, tossing down a frost bomb to reduce their life regeneration and cold resistance. For most map bosses, you won't actually need to swap your single target gems since we have so much base damage from the staff. The passive trees and path of building pace bin are included in the description. Some pros of the build. It's a competent all around character, being able to do almost any content that you would like. It has a massive life pool for mitigating and recovering. It has consistent and reliable damage output as we are not crit and do not fully rely on our flasks. We have a very stand and deliver playstyle on most all bosses where we can hold down our right click. Some cons. We have a staff, so this means we must use flame dash or lightning warp for movement and we have no fortify. It's not the fastest map clearing character in part due to our main weapon being a staff. It's expensive to fully gear, however many of these are small and medium price purchases such as jewels and various elder items. For class and ascendancy we are choosing the Scion Ascendant. Within this class we can choose two compact ascendancies from other main classes, however you may only choose one ascendancy from each main class. For this build we will be taking the Marauder's Juggernaut and the Duelist Slayer. The Juggernaut provides us with chill and stun immunity, which is great for our cast speed and blade vortex sustain on heavy hitting monsters. We also get endurance charge generation whenever we are hit, which happens very frequently, ensuring that they are available for mitigation or our immortal call. The Slayer provides us with some extra area, damage, and calling strike to quicken our fights up. However, the most important buff here is that our life leech instances will continue through full life. This means that if we are at full life and leeching, we can still be building leech instances to keep the leech going during and long after the fight has ended. This helps us recover almost instantly after taking a big hit on full life, since our leech is running at full effect. Finally, we're going to take Path of the Marauder. This is so that we can start from the Marauder and detach from the Scion, as his nodes are more valuable. For the Ascendancy progression, I would follow this order. We grab the following keystones in the tree. Blood Magic. We take this keystone not only to grab more life, but to remove the issue of mana regeneration and leech from the build, allowing us to always be able to reach maximum stacks of Blade Vortex prior to engaging bosses. Without it, we would only be able to reach a few stacks prior to a boss. Elemental Overload. Since we are taking advantage of conversion to gain more from the non-chaos damage gained as chaos and we cannot easily go crit with our pathing, this provides us another excellent more multiplier to scale our damage. Here is the complete endgame passive tree, with no skill effect duration. Only use this tree if you have the blade vortex enchant duration. If you do not have this, take the skill effect duration right above the scion, and remove some life nodes from the tree. Defensively we are grabbing almost every single life node that we can. We garner around 252% from the tree and get another 56% from jewels for a total of 310% increased life. Along with raw life, we also gain life regeneration. Offensively, we look to get every single jewel socket that we can, as these are how we scale our damage effectively, as there are only a few good generic spell damage nodes in the tree. I would follow this progression into the final tree. For bandits, we will be killing all of them for the two passive points. Here are some useful pantheons for the build. For the major, we will want to use Soul of Arakali. We will want to also ensure that we upgrade this Pantheon to get the 50% increased recovery rate for life when you have stopped taking damage over time recently. This greatly increases our recovery rate and will work with the Mortal Call proccing on our Siphoning Charge debuff and when our Siphoning Charge debuff ends. For Miners, you can make use of any of them depending on the situation. Here are the following gem links for the build. Support gem links are shown in order of importance, 
and gems with a set level are either due to their effect not scaling with level, or a requirement for a cast when damage taken. This is the main skill setup. For mapping, I use increased area of effect and elemental proliferation. Elemental proliferation is used to ensure that I shock enemies so that they explode with the impulses for more area coverage. As we are not crit, we will not always be applying ailments. For bosses, I swap to concentrated effect and elemental focus. If you find that you want to have more blade vortex duration, you can also swap elemental focus for efficacy. I also found that we have so much raw damage that I could easily take down most map bosses with the mapping links, albeit slower but completely fine if you don't want to swap. This is our main movement skill. I wanted to try and make Lightning Warp work for the build, since it has no cooldown and actually isn't that bad. However, it is definitely a skill that you have to get used to and invest some links and quality gems in to make it feel smooth. If you don't feel like doing this, you can simply use Flame Dash with the faster casting if you would prefer that. Having our Immortal Call on a low level cast on damage taken is key to ensure that it always procs when it's off cooldown. This is used on bosses to reduce their regeneration and cold resistance. Vol Haste is just here for mapping. A general note for gearing is that we want to try and get at least four or more Shaper or Elder items equipped for increasing the number of siphoning charges. These are the items with celestial or tentacle backgrounds. The more of these that we equip, the more damage and leech that we will obtain. However, be aware that the more charges means more degeneration. I found that five charges were easily sustainable once we reach our final levels and items, and is the amount of charges that I get with the gear that I will show, but we could probably squeeze in one more if we could itemize it perfectly. For our helmet, we want to just grab a rare helmet with life and resistances. I also highly recommend trying to get one with the Blade Vortex duration enchantment, thus allowing you to drop the skill effect duration in the tree. I don't recommend any unique helmets for this build. Here is the rare helmet affix priority. For the helmet enchant, you will want to look for the 30% increase Blade Vortex duration. A comb's heart will be the number one choice for our endgame encounters due to the raw life that we get from it. However, there are many other unique or rare chests that you could easily use during your other content or even in place of a combs. Also, since we do not need our other 6 link, as we plan for a combs, your chest swap does not need to be linked. As I spoke about earlier, I use an Impulse's Broken Heart while I am mapping for the shock-based explosions. You could also make use of an Elder or Shaped Rare chest with various mods and gain another siphoning charge. Here are the other unique options. If you choose to use none of these, you may also make use of a rare body armor with the following affix priority. Prim Sorrow Gloves will be our best option for this build, since we need to convert all of the physical damage to elemental, and there are not too many great options for caster specific affixes on rare gloves that we can make use of. Another neat thing that you can do here is get a shaped or elder pair of Prim Sorrows. Since the Goathide Gloves base only have one unique, the Prim Sorrows, and they are such a low level unique, the chances of getting one with a chance orb are pretty good. So you can buy a shaped or elder pair of goat hide gloves and scour chance them into our rim sorrows to add another elder or shaper item to the build for another siphoning charge. As we can see here, I have an elder variant of them. I don't recommend any other unique or rare gloves as we need these for the conversion. Our boots will simply be rare to help fill out life and elemental resistances. Try to get a 30 plus percent movement speed roll on these so that you can warp to and from enemies as quickly as possible. I don't recommend any unique boots. Here's the affix priority for rare boots. You'll want to look for these enchantments. You'll want to get a rare belt mainly focusing on life, strength, and elemental resistances. I was able to snag a Stygian Vise for a reasonable price for the extra abyssal socket and Mastercraft movement speed on it. I don't recommend any unique belts. Here's the affix priority for your rare belt. For our amulet, you will want to try and get a rare Elder Amulet, with life, dexterity, and percentage of non-chaos damage gained as chaos damage. This mod adds a fair chunk of damage and is very worth getting. I was able to get this amulet for a steal for around 45 chaos. I don't really recommend any other unique amulets. If you choose not to use an Elder Amulet, you could then make use of a regular rare amulet with the following affixes, but I highly recommend that you look for an Elder or Shaped base with these affixes. The rings were a heavy debate for me. Since we are blood magic, we won't be able to use auras unless we use an essence worm. But in testing, I found that essence worm with hatred was beat by using the new mark of the shaper ring. Not only do we gain another siphoning charge by using this bad boy, but we also gain percentage maximum life and a whole lot of spell damage from this ring, as long as our other ring is an elder ring. And you know what that means, another siphoning charge. 
For a rare Elder Ring, you can just look for life, elemental resistances, and any stats you may be lacking. Finally, we will be using the all-powerful Disintegrator Staff from the Uber Elder Encounter for our weapon. As talked about in the introduction, this staff adds a massive amount of flat damage to our spells, along with granting some very powerful charges for more damage and life leech utility. On top of this, it allows us to make use of the Comb's Heart in our chest slot, as we can place a six link in it. For flasks, we will be using the following. A Taste of Hate. This is ideal for its offensive and defensive properties. It acts as a mini hatred buff, and we can also get non-chaos damage gained as chaos damage from our siphoning charges. Aziri's Promise. Again, like the Taste of Hate, we are able to gain chaos damage from our physical and elemental conversion base as chaos damage for excellent returns. Sulfur Flask. For generic, increased damage as well as consecrated ground for 6% life regeneration whilst we stand on it. A Quicksilver Flask. This is almost a necessity to get good movement speed, especially for Lightning Warp. Make sure that you at least get the Adrenaline Suffix for more movement speed. And finally, you will want a Life Flask. This could be Divine or Eternal, and you want it rolled with Increased or Instant Recovery. Here are some other good unique flask options. Blood of the Karui. This flask is very good for the life recovery after we get massive amounts of health. The only reason I do not have it in my main lineup of flasks is that I am already shorty suffix space to remove bleed, freeze, and curse. This can be swapped in for boss fights where you know you won't need one of those suffixes, however. The Overflowing Chalice. This is a decent mapping flask that you can fit in, as it will keep your flask charges topped up at all times. Again, I do not have it in my main lineup due to flask suffix shortages, but you could easily swap it between your other sulfur flask base. As for jewels, I will provide the affix priority for both regular and abyss jewels, along with example jewels that were used in my build. For regular jewels, we want to look for the following affixes. Don't be afraid to get some resistances on your jewels if you do need them. I ended up with one jewel with resistance until I was able to itemize a bit better. For the most part, I tried to get two damage properties with life, costing me somewhere between 12 to 25c for each jewel. Abyss jewels are fairly weak in this build due to the pure amount of flat damage we get. However, they do have a utility of gaining Onslaught. I recommend getting an Abyss Jewel with percentage chance to gain Onslaught on kill, paired with one or more of the following affixes. Leveling this build was quite easy and not too much of a hassle with the proper leveling uniques and supporting items. I was able to get through leveling without a hitch with these leveling uniques. I recommend getting the Darkness Enthroned and placing some decent spell-based Abyss Jewels in them while leveling. The Princess Sabers are great to dual wield for two mini hatred auras. The Calton Halt also provides this and will provide some more defenses as it's a shield with some resistance. At level 17 you can make use of Malachi's Simula to start your blood magic action if you do not have access to Elrion minus mana cost jewelry or are unable to sustain mana properly, but be aware you will not be able to use any auras. For gem progression I recommend the following. I also recommend grabbing a first snow threshold jewel and placing it in the jewel socket to the top left of the scion start for leveling in the beginning only until you get your blade vortex. From here, you will want to just fill out your supporting gem setups and replace support gems in your main links with the ones in the guide. When transitioning to the Disintegrator, you want to make sure you have at least three or more Elder or Shaped items equipped, including the Staff, so that you will have enough percentage life leech to get some sustain when you start mapping. Prior to level 80 when you can wear Mark of the Shaper, you can either use a random Elder or Shaper Rare Ring, or the Essence Worm with Hatred in it. Well, that was one husky scion if I do say so myself. All in all, I was very impressed with the power that we could pull from this staff while investing so heavily into life and regeneration on the passive tree. We ended up with respectable mapping speed, certainly not tier 1 clearing speed, but we had consistent bossing damage along with a beefy life pool to eat any damage that comes our way. I still think there are a ton of other ways that this staff could be built around, and there are for sure options that push the damage into the stratosphere, albeit at the loss of some defense. But if you're interested in giving this staff a go, I would highly recommend this variant of the build for all-around sustainability for any encounter. I know I enjoyed my time with this voluptuous scion, and you will too. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one, Exile.